That music always grooves me up in the morning. Welcome back to another epic week, everybody. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I think we've got a lot of familiar faces today, maybe some new folks scattered in there. Well, whatever you are, it is so nice to have you back as we continue to showcase and celebrate such amazing scientists, explorers, places around this planet. It has been a really exciting April, and I'm so excited to dive in with today's group. Now, when I was the age of some of our students joining live today, when I thought about wildlife, I always thought about East Africa, the Great Barrier Reef, maybe the Amazon rainforest, and those places are amazing. We've done programs from those places over the last few years, and you can check them all out on our YouTube channel. But what we want to feature today is amazing wildlife right in the backyard, metaphorically speaking, maybe literally speaking for some of our classes, uh, today joining us across Ontario, and that is at the Prince Edward Point Bird Observatory. So this is a truly amazing uh, place our organization group of individuals that do incredible work to conserve, understand more about migrating birds, and share that passion with the public. I really do. I'm going to bring this up many times throughout the broadcast, but check out their website at pepsbo.ca. We'll be linking that in the YouTube chat as well. But what we want to do today is dive in with a live bird banding. So first, we're going to talk to Nature Hood Coordinator and all-around fantastic educator, Cheryl. She is going to take us on a little journey about what Pepsbo does and what they're all about. And then we're going to head over to see Philip with some live Five birds captured in the last few minutes to learn about how they go about that process and show it to all you guys live. So without further ado, Cheryl, thank you so much for joining us today and take us away. <laughs> all right, welcome. Thank you, Jesse, for that introduction. I'm going to do a, just a brief introduction with a bit of a slideshow because we're never sure if we can get live birds, what the weather will be like, and uh, whether our internet connection at the observatory will be adequate for this. So I'm going to share my screen with you and we'll get going through that as quickly as we can so we can get on to Philip who has the live birds, which is far more exciting. So we'll just do that share quickly. And get you going with our slideshow. So Prince Edward Point Bird Observatory studies, uh, well, first of all, we're the caretaker of a national wildlife area, which is a big responsibility. It's also one of only three monarch reserves in Canada. And uh, beyond that responsibility, we also run a scientific research station where we study birds, all sorts of birds. Sometimes we're looking at large birds like raptors, like the uh, Cooper's hawk. This was a Cooper's hawk here, uh, or sharp-shinned hawks. Sometimes we're looking at owls, mostly the small saw wet owls, but sometimes big owls like this barred owl here. We also look at even tiny birds. We don't band hummingbirds at our facility, but hummingbirds can be banded. So even teeny tiny birds can be studied at banding research stations. Our primary focus, our main focus, are birds called passerines or perching birds. And all of these birds have these features in common. They all have these things. So they all have a foot with three toes in front and one toe in the back for perching. They lay colored eggs and their babies, the nestlings or chicks, stay in the nest. If you think about a chicken, it has the same three toes in front and uh, one toe in back on its foot, like, like our bird here. And, they, but, and some of them lay colored eggs, but their chicks don't stay in the nest. Their chicks walk about and can eat food on their own right after they hatch. So a chicken wouldn't qualify to be a passerine or a perching bird. So that's how we tell what a passerine is. And passerines is the largest uh, order of birds. So many of the birds you see belong to this order. And there's a great variety, including the songbirds in the passerine order of birds. And they have birds of all sizes. So from the big crow through the robin sized birds like the ones we see here to a lot of very small birds. We have a lot of tiny birds in the passerine family. Lots and lots of tiny birds in this family. So we're banding a lot of very small birds and middle sized birds along with a few larger ones, whichever, whatever birds we can capture in our nets, that's what we're studying. Now there's something else that all of these birds have in common, and that's that they migrate. They move from one place to another according to the seasons. So the birds that we study are migratory birds, mostly the passerines. 
and that's a long journey for those birds and it can be quite dangerous. So why do they migrate if it's going to be a long and dangerous journey? Well, in the fall, they're going to fly south looking for more food. There's not much to eat in Canada in the middle of the winter for a lot of birds, so they go looking for more food. The fact that it's warmer temperatures is just a bonus for them. In the spring, that's now, they're going to come back to Canada, flying north, looking for space. They want places to raise a family. They need a habitat with lots of food, the right kind of food, and shelter, water, all the things they need to survive, and they need it all for themselves, for their family. So they're looking for space. And in Canada, we're fortunate to have beautiful boreal forests. A lot of these patterns are looking to come to the forest to raise their family. And they travel on different pathways, depending on where they're coming from. So there's the Western Flyway, Eastern Flyway. And let's see where we are. We've got some folks joining us from Oregon and California. You're in that Western Flyway. You're going to see different birds than what we see here in the Eastern Flyway. And this is the rest of us over here. And where's Prince Edward Point Bird Observatory in all of this? Right there, right in the middle of that Eastern Flyway. So we're capturing birds as they fly south in the fall and fly north again in the springtime. And we capture those birds and we band them. And I'm going to explain what that banding looks like in just a moment. But while we've got the map in front of us, I thought I'd share a story about how banding works in terms of understanding what happens with birds. Petbo banded a bird called a, a, a thrush. It's about the size of a robin. We banded the Swanson's thrush here and it was captured again in North Carolina, hello, North Carolina, 11 days later. So we know that a bird flying south that size can fly from Ontario to North Carolina in 11 days on just those tiny wings. That's pretty amazing. If that bird's captured again further south, we'll know how far south that bird might travel. Maybe North Carolina is as far as it's going, maybe it's going further. So banding gives us that kind of information about the birds. So what are bands? Well, these are bands here. They're made of aluminum, so they're very lightweight. These ones are the size of a pencil eraser. And every band has a number, its own number. That means every bird that gets a band on its leg has its own number and we can identify that bird. So when it's captured and we put the band number in a database, it will tell us the story of that bird. And we can see this is a perching bird, a passerine, because there's those three toes front, one toe back. We put the band on this part of the leg so that it doesn't go off the, over the foot or go up higher on the leg. It just sits there very comfortably. It's like wearing a watch. The bird doesn't even notice that it's there. So how are we gonna get this little metal bracelet on these bird legs? Well, we'll find out. First, we have to capture the birds. So we're gonna spend a day um, at the observatory in a little video here to see how we capture the birds and how we get the bands on their legs. So this is our laboratory here and back here where the rainbow is, is where all the birds are that we want to band. So let's start our little video. We'll see if hopefully we don't have a lot of lag on our video. Come on video. So I'm hoping it's up there for you now. Our day starts very, very early at sunrise. Philip and the other banders go out early and put the nets up as the sun's coming up. We need nice weather, no rain, no high winds in order to keep the birds safe. The safety of birds is number one for us. You can see our lab and the little cottage where our banders live during the banding season. And Prince Edward Point's been working for 26 years. We've been around a long time and we're out on the end of a peninsula or a point out into the lake. So the birds come there to make a shorter crossing across the lake. And you can see all the bands are ready. And this list is a list of all of the scientific code names for the birds that they have captured so far this season. That would have been the season this was filmed. The bands are all sized with a number just like shoe sizes for people and different species of birds wear different sizes of bands. So I'm hoping that you're seeing what I'm seeing here. Oh, um, those were the tools that we used to put the bands on. And we put our, our nets 
to catch the birds out on the property in different habitats. We're looking to capture different birds, so we put the nets in different places. The banders go out every half hour to collect the birds from the nets to make sure that they stay safe. So we have wetlands, we have forests, we have scrubland, we have evergreen forests, and this is what the nets look like. Very fine um, mesh that the birds don't even see, and they're flying through the forest or the area looking for food and they encounter a net. Then we have to untangle the birds from the net very gently. The blowing helps to move the feathers out of the way in a nice way. There's a little jungle that Philip's going to remove from the net. They sort of do a somersault into the, the net when their head hits it and they back the birds out. And you can see the net there, that little pocket is where the birds and land when they when they hit the net. And this is a little chickadee being extracted from the net. Chickadees are feisty. The birds sometimes peck at the people at the banders, but it doesn't really hurt that much. Each bird is put into its very own cotton bag so that it can breathe and be comfortable and safe in a soft spot where it's uh, protected. Philip's putting a clothes peg at the top of the bag and that has a number on it for the net. We record all the information about those where the birds were captured and now they're on their way back to the laboratory where we'll collect all the data about those birds. So we write down the weather for that day, who the banders are, what net the bird was caught in, we weigh the birds, we keep them in the bag to weigh them so they don't fly away, they won't sit on the scale for us, they're not cooperative. <laughs> And all the birds come back now, they're inside the lab, each one in its own bag waiting its turn. And you can see the clothes pegs that tell us which net they were caught in. That helps us identify the different habitats the birds prefer. And you can see to one side the scribe who's writing, who's uh, entering into the computer, the information as the banders give it to them. So this little yellow warbler already had a band, so that's called a recapture. The bird was already been banded, so now we're just going to record the information and enter it in for that band number. Perhaps it's a bird we've already captured and banded, or perhaps it's been banded at another station, and over time we'll find out uh, the story of this little bird. So what you're going to see now is uh, they're checking the bird's fat levels. Under the skin, they can see how much fat the bird has accumulated on its breast, and that will say whether it has energy enough to continue migrating or whether it needs to stay a few days more and, and eat more. So this little yellow warbler is going to be released to continue its journey. And hopefully it won't be captured again in the near future. And the birds wait patiently for their turn a little bit. Some of them are patient and some of them are not so patient and they are anxious to get back on their journey, that feisty fellow there. And there you can see our scribe entering the data um, as it's given to her. And we're going to see Philip here banding a bird. So he's weighed the bird, and it zeroes out the basket and the other bag weight, so we get just the weight of the bird. Most birds are around um, 8 grams or so. That's about a quarter of an ounce uh, for those of you in the States. So Philip's chosen the band size for this type of bird. He's opened it with those special pliers and he's putting it around the leg and then closing it gently around the leg. He makes sure it can move. And now he's looking at the feathers very, very carefully to see how old the bird is. He measures the wing length. That tells him if this bird is a boy or a girl because this type of bird, I think is an oven bird, maybe, or no, water thrush and uh, they look the same male and female. So the wing length will tell us if it's a boy or a girl. All done and away it goes, just that quickly. And here we see Jessica. Again, she's checking the feathers very carefully to decide how old the bird is. We can tell if a bird is a year old, a hatchling bird, and after that, they're all the same because every year they, give, they replace their feathers and we can't age them by feathers anymore. And that's where banding can help us decide how old a bird is. Um, for example, we had a blue jay that we banded at Petbow in 2015. 
It was captured again in 2020 in New York State. And that tells us that a blue jay can be at least five years old because that one lived for five years flying back and forth and was captured twice in that time. We've had a grackle. That's the blackbird that I'm sure you'll see in your schoolyards. It's a blackbird with a shiny purple blue head. We banded one in 2009 and it was captured again in the county in 2020. So that means that the grackle had been flying back and forth, migrating that long journey for nine years, no, 11 years, 11 years, sorry. So that's how banding information can help us decide on the age of birds, where those birds are traveling to and from, and what's happening in their lives when we collect uh, the banding information. So that's another bird in her hand there. I'm going to stop our video now so we can get to um, hear from Philip right away. So the information that we gather goes into big databases that scientists can use uh, to decide how to move forward in the world with what, what needs to change to keep birds safe. And if bird habitats are safe, then our habitats are safe because we share this planet with the birds. And because birds move back and forth, we're able to learn more about the planet from birds than we would from, say, studying a mouse in his little field who doesn't go anywhere else but his little field. And when we know what needs to happen, then we know where to put our resources toward making changes to make our planet a safer place for everyone to live on. And are there things that you can do as a student? For sure. You can help birds by becoming a bird watcher. When you know about an animal or anything really, you're more inclined to protect it and take care of it. The number one killer of birds in Canada and in the United States are cats. So keeping your cat indoors can help save birds. Making your windows bird safe by putting uh, stickers on them or drawing on them with paints. Making your yard friendly by putting a bird bath out, giving them water or food can be helpful. And joining a conservation group can also help you learn more about the environment in your area and ways that you can help. And there's power in numbers. So thank you for watching my little video. I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen now so we can turn things over to Philip to answer your questions. Fantastic, Cheryl, what a great presentation to lead us into Philip. And again, classes, whether you're on YouTube or live, we look very forward to your questions. Keep those thoughts in your head as we get the chance to check out and see if we've got some live birds joining us today from the Banding Observatory site. So Philip, welcome in, man. Nice to see you again. Yeah, nice to see you too. All right, so we did get um, a couple birds. So I'll show you guys kind of how the process works uh, this way. So, um, so we got this one bird here, as you guys saw in the video with the peg on it. So I know that this bird came from, it's backwards for you guys, but 8C. Um, and so like you saw in the video, I'm gonna wave a bird here. Here are the scale. And then I'm going to undo the bag and then grab the bird here and then reach in and pick it up. So I pull out the bird and we have a black capped chickadee. So as you can see here, the black capped chickadee and it's biting me. So <laughs> they like to bite. So they're a little feisty and he already has a band on his leg. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be entering that data onto the banding page. Um, so the first thing, I'm, so I'm just going to enter this band number now. And so it's 2920. So this bird um, is probably captured from last year. So I'm going to enter its band number now, 2920. They have nine digits because each band is going to be significant to that one bird in all of North America. So that includes uh, the USA and Mexico. So this bird will always be the only bird with this band number uh, for the rest of its life. 07619. So from the data, we're able to tell that this bird is a black capped chickadee that we caught last year. And here we go. Now, so what I'm gonna do to age and sex this bird is I'm going to have a look at its wing. So if I open up its wing like this, then I'm able to tell the differences within its plumage here. And that'll tell me how old the bird is. So in the spring, every um, young bird that was hatched last year is going to be called in uh, 
a second year and every bird that is older than that will be called an after second year because if it's a young bird this bird will be in its second year of its life if it's an after second year then this bird is at least two years old so that's what that's why we call them those things so looking at its wing i can tell that there's a, a limit in its wing and even in its tail which is not as pretty as we would expect in a chickadee so we know that this bird is a young bird. So I'm gonna be able to label this bird as a uh, bird that was hatched last year. And um, these guys, we are not able to sex. So they are not sexually dimorphic, meaning they are not different colors, males or females. And we can't use their wing length to determine um, the sex of these guys. So, but I will still measure it for uh, the bird's uh, health. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab the ruler here and then I'm going to measure it. So I just let it lay flat on the wing cord here. And so I got a wing cord of 63. Um, and that's going to tell us that the bird has a 63 wing. That's a pretty average wing for a chickadee. And then I'm going to blow on its um, stomach here to see inside of its neck area, which is where they'll store their fat if they have any. So this guy does not have any fat. And that's not uh, uncommon because chickadees are local birds, meaning they don't need any fat to migrate. Uh, checking on its weight, it weighs 10.9 grams. So very, very light bird. And I mean, as you can see in my hand, it is very, very small. So going to, so this is the chickadee. I'm going to be letting it go now. And um, let's see if you guys can see release. So I just put my hand out and off it goes. <laughs> so, and we have another couple birds. So I'll just process these guys pretty quickly. This one was from 4A. And I believe it is another really small bird called a golden crown kinglet. So this is a golden crown kinglet right here. As you can see, it has this nice orange in its crown. So this already tells us that this is a male. So they have the yellow on the sides here, and then it's a male. And this bird is going to be uh, also very light. The first thing I'm going to do is check its band number because it's already banded to see if we did this bird today because we don't want to process a bird too many times um, in one day because they're busy foraging. So I'm gonna go see if this bird was banded today. It is band number 32 in our strand of bands and it was banded today. So we don't need to reprocess this bird today. So all we need to do now is let it go. So again, on the release, what we do is we just lay our hand out and let him fly away. So one last bird, final bird of this round. In the early parts of migration, we don't get really busy. So, um, you know, three birds is actually pretty good. So, um, especially at this time of day, it's been pretty cold too. So not a lot of birds have moved into the point yet. And uh, we're expecting a lot more birds as south winds push birds uh, back up north uh, from where they were. So this is another recapture. So this is, again, a recapture. And this is what we call a slate-colored junco. So there's a lot of types of juncos. This is the slate colored subspecies. So they're really pretty and gray and they have this nice white fan at the end of their tail here. So I can open up its tail for you like this. So if you ever see a little bird fly away and you see this white on the outside of its tail, it's likely these guys, especially in the winter, these little juncos. Uh, out west, you guys will have Oregon juncos and here on the east coast, we have these slate colored juncos. I'll check its band number again to see if we process this guy today. Let's see, band number 92. Survey says that we did it yesterday. So that means this bird does get processed again today because uh, from one day to the next, these birds can accumulate a lot of fat. So let's see what its band number is. So these numbers are really, really small, but um, you know that's required. We need to have nine on there. So it just takes a lot of really good keen eyesight to be able to look at all these numbers. So 29607502. So this bird is going to be banded yesterday, which is good. Now we're gonna open up its wing to see what it looks like. So it's kind of hard to see, but this bird actually has what we call a molt limit um within its wing so this part here on the upper part of its wing is a lot more brown compared to this nice gray and edging on its wing so that tells us that this bird is a young bird so uh it's what we call it was hatched last year so it's going to be a young bird and let's measure its wing cord that'll tell us if it's a male or a female 
So with a wing chord of 75, we have that as the in-between stage for this uh, bird's um, sex, and its mass is 22.5. So let's cancel that, 22.5. Now let's see what its fat content is. It has a lot of fat. So this guy has a lot of fat. I'll try to show you guys. Maybe you will be able to see. Let's see if I can show you guys. So I don't know if you guys were able to see, but there's a lot of fat in there, which is what we call a four fat. So that means this guy has filled up uh, all his fat all the way up to here, which means that it has a lot of energy and is ready to migrate. So... For the sex of this bird, what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at the outside of this bird. So we use its body plumage as well to sex this bird. So this one is pretty pale. It's not a very um, dark headed uh, bird. It has a lot of brown on its back and it's a younger bird. So this bird, we're able to call it a young female. So again, now she's all done. I've got every measurement that I need. So I'm going to let her go and off she goes. And that was our last bird of the day, uh, or not of the day, but of this round. So um, that's about it for these birds. Phil, that was amazing. And the, the kinglet is just an incredible bird. By the way, the slate color jungle, literally, I was waiting, going for a walk the other day. I saw a bird fly away with that little white bit of tail. I'm like, what is that? I don't know what that is. So, so you're not only inspiring our kids, you're educating me as well, which I'm very impressed with. So no, what an amazing That's awesome, story. yeah. We have got more questions on YouTube that we can shake a stick at. There will be a waiver class to share those questions after the fact if we don't get them into the live broadcast. But let's dive in with our query. So live classes, we'll come to you guys in a second, put those thinking caps on, see what you have to, to share with us. Uh, let's take this one from Miss Robinson's class. Hannah in Trenton wants to know, what's the biggest bird that's been banded? It's our classic question. Ooh, um, so we have bands that are really, really big. Um, let me show you. So this bag here has a lot of very, very big bands and they're called size eights. So it's one of our biggest bands that we have. Nine is the biggest you can go. And we use those on a double crested cormorant. So those are essentially sea ducks. And um, one of we used to have a banding project where we were catching sea ducks. I would say that typically now that that project is done, um, what we do is we, our biggest bird was probably the barred owl. So you saw that really big owl that um, Cheryl was showing you in her presentation. That's probably the biggest bird we've banded so far in the last, I guess, five years. So pretty interesting. I love that you call corporate sea ducks. That's an amazing term for them. I've never thought of them that way. That's great. <laughs> um, let's head to our John Black Badgers, Ms. O's class. If you guys want to come on in and unmute your mic, you are good to go for our first live question. Hey, guys, welcome in. All right. Unmute. There we are. Hi. Sorry. Hi there. Back. Thanks so much for having us today. Um, I have a student here who would like to ask a question. Perfect. Yeah, uh, you're good, man. What's, what's the most birds you've caught in one day? Ooh. Ooh, that's a really fun question. So last year, um, we had a really, really, really crazy day where all the birds decided that they were going to stop here at the point. And uh, we ended up catching something around 800 birds in our nets, which is way too many birds that we can actually handle um, and ban properly and safely. So our goal is always to have bird safety first. So because we had so many birds, we had to release about 300 of them um, uh, back out without a band on them. But we kept note of what species they were, so we knew what was in the area. And um, that was the most birds we've ever had um, in one day, which was very crazy. A lot of fun. <laughs> I bet. Uh, great question, guys. All right, let's head to Miss D's class. Joining us is John McCray and Will. Do you guys have one? Come on up, great dudes. Hi. Mm. Hi. Uh, do you celebrate their birthdays? <laughs> From Blair. Oh, no, yeah. Well, for bird birthdays, which is really fun, their birthdays are always on January 1st because that's when we call them. Uh, I guess, into their second year. Um, but we don't really have a way to know exactly when their birthday is. But what's really fun is that most birds are actually born in June or July. So if any of you have a birthday in June or July, you probably share the same birthday as one of those birds. 
Very cool. All right. Mr. Bocci, Miss Cars Class, you guys have your cameras off, so I want to make sure that you're all good to go. You can let me know in the chat, and I'll come to you for live questions. But we'll take one from YouTube while we're waiting for just a second. Miss LaSalle's class is a great question. I always love this one. Uh, why do you put the birds in opaque bags instead of clear containers where they can see, and how do you make sure they can breed in those bags? Always the animal concern questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... For the animal concern part is that those cloth bags are dark enough so um, that birds are let more calm. So if you ever had to put a towel on top of a bird cage like uh, pet birds uh, to help them go to sleep, that's kind of a similar situation that happens here. It makes them really calm. If they can see the outside or an escape route, that will make them freak out a lot more and like try to escape um, through a bag that's essentially or container that's essentially keeping them trapped. And uh, for the bags, we make sure that they're made with really, really light material. So um, just like the masks that we um, wear uh, during COVID, I'm sure everybody's familiar here, um, we're able to breathe through them and so are they. So it's uh, there's no worry for them there um, on that front, but we never use any really thick materials to hinder yeah. their breathing or breathing. Great question, guys. And by the way, it's really interesting. I mean, you talk about it, of course, in a bird context, but we've had people bring you know, talk about all manner of animals, amphibians, reptiles, what have you. And pretty much the universal thing is to put them in a cloth bag. Like that is, if you have a snake, if you have a lizard, if you have a small mammal, like it goes in a little bag, it's calming, it's relaxing, it's a nice opportunity to give them the chance to settle down before you process them. So I always love that question. All right, Mr. Bocci's class, joining us in Toronto, I'm heading to you next. Come on in, great force. Uh, why do you like studying birds? Yeah, why birds, Philip? <laughs> So the reason I really like birds is because there are birds literally everywhere all the time. You know, uh, I think it's really cool when we see things like coyotes or foxes and wolves or whatever, but there are always going to be birds. You can always keep an ear out and you can always hear birds, especially in the spring when they're all singing. And uh, every year there's always somewhere you can go to see really cool birds. So for me, the fact that I was able to see wildlife all the time, everywhere is something that really, really got me interested in studying birds. And then the fact that I can actually gain a lot of information about them and their populations by actually handling birds, that's why, like, that's something that just sold me on it even more. Well, your passion sure, certainly shines through, Philip. So it's always nice that we get that question too, guys. Thanks, Mr. Bocci's class. Miss Carr's class, joining us at Copeland Public School. Welcome in and Brampton. Unmute your mic and you're all good for a live one. Hey. Hi, Jesse. Hi. Hey. Hey. Hi. Uh, that's my friend Hi. first. Right? Okay. Hi. Uh, I have Hi. Sahib asking Hi. a question. Hi. Okay, guys. Guys. Okay, listen. Bye. Bye. Oh. Well behaved, guys. Okay. Hi for one second. Then we'll get our question in, right? Bye. 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 I have to meet them, Ms. Carver. I'm so excited. Bye. 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 Sorry about that. Let me meet you. We can we can come back in a second too. I'm sorry about that. They had you're a question. Go, go, go. How, how yeah. when do you okay? Yeah, you're set. So, okay, so when you take off their bands, how do you do that? Yeah. So uh, we don't have to take off their, their bands unless the band is really really worn and we have to replace it. Um, so these bands are made in a way that's really soft and kind of really, really light because they're made out of aluminum. So that way that bird um, does not get hindered by it and it doesn't get caught on anything. So that's why we make sure we have the right band size. So that way it can stay on the bird's leg um, as long as it lives. And that way if it's found or recaptured somewhere else, then we're able to actually use that to um, identify that bird. Um, but if we do have to take one off, we do have special pliers like this um, that are made to go right inside that band and then we just press on these pliers to open up the band while it's on the leg of the bird without actually hurting the bird's leg and that's how we take them off if we have to replace it or fix the band or something uh, depending on the issue but uh, we have all the tools that we need for that yeah very cool so nice that we get the chance to see them all too um let's head on a, a similar band question britain vid miss nagel's class want to know how many birds lose their bands so like, do they ever just fall off? Do they, you know, is that a possibility? Or once you've got them on, there's no way other than you actually taking them? There, there would be little to no way for a bird to lose their band. Back in the day when they started banding birds, they were putting aluminum bands on any birds that they could. And then they realized that there needed to be a certain amount of thickness for the band because some birds were just able to actually peck it off of their leg 
Um, so they made sure that it was um, thick enough that a bird couldn't peg it off. And for the birds that have really strong bills, like a cardinal that everybody probably knows, um, those birds have really strong beaks. So some sometimes they use steel bands that are a stronger material, but still very lightweight um, for the bird. Um, and especially on bigger birds, you can use stronger bands because the bird is so much bigger that it can handle more weight. So the little aluminum bands are great for the little birds that don't aren't able to peck it off since they don't have the bill for it. And then um, other than that, uh, we just use better bands for it. But typically it's really, really hard for a bird to lose its band um, as long as the right band size is used. I like the little historical scientific context like we just keep getting better and better at this because we know what we're doing now. Um, fantastic guys. All right, we're gonna go back to our live class for one more round. Philip, you're like whipping through these, man. I always love Q&A with you. Uh, John Black Batman, right. visit with class. Come on back in. And Unmute your mic, you're good to go. Hey. How long can a bird fly before it gets too tired? So that's a really interesting question too. Recently, I think that record was uh, beat with this one uh, godwit that flew, um, I think it was for almost 36 hours straight, nonstop in the sky, just completely nonstop from one island to the next all the way down to Australia. Um, so that was a really, really crazy flight that we learned about um, actually in 2021. So that's a long flight. Yeah. So Philip, just as a follow up to this, like we know birds that cross whole oceans. So are they like stopping and taking a rest in the water and then continuing on from there typically? Or like, how do they do that if you're going from like the Arctic to the Antarctic? Are you stopping every which way? Or like, how do you, how do you make that work? <laughs> Yeah, so any birds that are going to be crossing the ocean typically actually follow little land uh, masses or islands if they've come to that point. But, you know, since we're oceans away from um, Europe or Asia, then um, birds typically don't actually cross oceans that often. A lot of shorebirds will follow um, islands and go like all the way south and then circumvent the planet that way or even go up north. So if you follow um, I guess the Gulf of the St. Lawrence in Quebec, and you go all the way up that way, they'll follow that into Greenland and then end up in Europe. So that's why we get a lot of European vagrants sometimes. And it's usually the bigger birds, not really the smaller ones. Um, and uh, they just island hop their way or, uh, yeah, or they're made for it like um, shorebirds and stuff like that that have longer flights. You know what we need to do, Philip, is we need to get you on like a funded expedition where you follow the migratory route. And I mean, it'd be cool. You'd see birds on the way, but you could also get like the greatest adventure of all time, just go island hopping on oh, the yeah. way. Pick one of those Caribbean oh, birds. Yeah. Um, Mr. Rogers, <laughs> come on back in for a second question. Hey, guys. Come on down. What special equipment do you use? Ooh, nice question. All right, so we have a lot of special equipment. So as you saw in the videos, we have our banding pliers. So these are banding pliers that we use to put on the birds. And then we have uh, these to take bands off. And then we have a ruler that has specifically a little notch on it so that we can rest the shoulder of the bird's wing on it. Um, and then we have, I guess our bands are pretty special. So these are like the small little bands. And then apart from that, we have things that are called mist nets. So a mist net is what we use to catch the birds. And those nets are, um, as you saw in the video, it's like a really long volleyball net, but there's a bunch of them stacked on top of each other and it creates a pocket of netting. So that's probably our most specialized equipment because it's really, really thin um, netting that like you can't even see. Like sometimes I have fallen into a net before because I can't actually see the net because of how invisible it is. And uh, that's pretty much all of our specialized equipment. We need uh, like a camera set up on the outside of your booth. If you ever catch footage of yourself falling with net, we would like that incorporated into the next broadcast. <laughs> Please. Um, so I love this question. Okay, so I've, I've already shared this with some of our teacher friends. We're going to have a Padlet at the end of today's program. So for teachers that want to share more questions after the fact, we are nearing the end of the broadcast. You can keep your questions there, and for two days, we'll leave it up. Our first Padlet question came in, and it's awesome. So because of your little computer thing you showed us there, they want to know uh, bird 007. So like the ring 007, what kind of bird is the Bond bird? Like, do you have it? Oh, on here? I can find you a 007 bird pretty quickly. Um, so we have something called a brown creeper on 007. So those are really small birds that look like... Um, they look like nuthatches, if everybody has seen a nuthatch before. Um, 
Let's see. I think that's about it for this band strand. Let's go see if we can find another one. <laughs> Thank you for your dedication to this. Uh... Question. Common okay. yellow throat. So that's actually really fun. If you guys look up the picture of a common yellow throat and you look up a male, um, you're going to see a common yellow throat and they have a really cool black mask on them, you know, so it makes them look kind of like Zorro. So essentially pretty close to 007, if you ask me. I am going to pull this up for folks as we are talking about it. Uh, so you can see what a common yellow throat looks like. So here's my very quick uh, Google search. You can check that out. But what a gorgeous bird. Oh. Perfect for our 007 bird. Nice. <laughs> oh, yeah. Awesome question, guys. All right. You know what? We are nearing the end of the broadcast. So what I want to make sure we do is uh, give our kids the opportunity to keep the learning going after they're done. Again, best way to do that, check out petpo.ca. You'll learn about all the amazing work they do to conserve wildlife, to uh, understand it. You can check out some of their other broadcasts with us on the YouTube channel. We have done a bevy of programs with Philip, with Cheryl. Uh, you can check them all out on the Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants YouTube. Amazing stuff there. Um, before we wrap up, I, I will take one more question from Ms. Cars class. Just typed in, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Philip wants to know, when did you decide to become a bander? So we talked a little earlier about why you love birds. Like what got you specifically into this? Because you're so passionate about it. So when I was finished high school, I decided to take a program called Environment and Wildlife Management. So that taught me a bunch of different techniques for um, wildlife and environment surveys. And one of those things was banding birds. So that's when I got the bug and the itch to try to do this more. Um, and I volunteered as much as I could. And um, when I found out that I could actually get a job doing it um, and running a station like I do here, um, I just dove head first into it, got as much experience as I could. And uh, the rest is history. Now, here I am. <laughs> it's amazing how many of the speakers we have on, no matter what field they're in, that start with volunteering. If you love something, go talk to the people that are doing that work already. See if you can get involved. I mean, I'm sure when you got underway, you were doing small jobs. You weren't banding birds from minute one when you got there. Not even close, right? But now you have this no, opportunity no. to do it where you have to release 300 of them because there's so many coming in and you get to share it with so many classes. So I, I think that's a great message for our kids and just really appreciate you joining us today, Philip. Oh, yeah. All right, guys, uh, again, check out that website. Check out the Padlet if you want to share more questions there. We'd love to get more non-007 questions in the days to come. I'll bring in Cheryl as well. Thank you so much for your presentation kicking off today's broadcast of your awesome bird background as always. <laughs> and as you both know, what we're going to do to wrap up, I'm going to bring in our class to say a big thank you and farewell to our John Black Badgers crew, Mr. Bocce's class, Miss Carter's class. Thank you all so much for taking part today. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Bye for now, guys. See you all. Bye. Bye.